and uh, it's called The Elevator Dancer, it is unpublished. <clears throat> shift change, change shift, hum drum and ho hum, and on the little screen a woman dances. She is in the elevator. She is alone in the elevator and she is dancing because there is no one to see her but the security camera and the security guard who watches its output on the little screen. She is dancing the mashed potatoes. He knows the name of the dance because he remembers his mother doing it in a silly moment of his childhood. It's a silly dance at the best of times, even for a good dancer, which this woman is not. Yet the guard does not press the button beside his workstation. He does not alert the police, who these days concern themselves with other things besides crime. He simply stares at her as she twists her feet and hips over and over, bopping her head too in time to her own internal rhythm. Then the automated elevator voice says, you have reached your floor, and the woman stops. She is not breathing hard. Not a hair is out of place. No drop of sweat mars her <coughs> gray skirt suit to suggest that here is a woman who cares only for her own pleasure. Here is a woman who has a life alone, and worst of all, enjoys it. The door opens and she walks out. Several people walk in. And the, door, the, the, <coughs> excuse me, and the guard sits back in his chair, his every nerve and hair follicle a tingle. He wonders when they will come for him, but they do not. At the end of the shift, he goes home to his modest house and the modest wife that the government assigned to him. And he, as he eats his dinner, she is prepared. He thinks about the woman in the elevator. After dinner, he helps his wife clean up. That much is not prescribed as woman's work. His hands are slick with grease and suds, and he thinks about the liquid movement of the elevator woman's hips. Later that evening, he and his wife watch TV together. And during the prayer and commercial break, he wonders what the elevator woman prays for. That night, his wife sighs as usual while she does her wifely duty. And he sighs as usual as he climbs on top of her. And as an otherwise lackluster orgasm passes through his flesh, his soul is consumed with the mem memory of the woman in the elevator. Change shift, shift change, and he walks <coughs> on the screens in the little dark room. His supervisors would think him very diligent, but he is watching just for her. He leans forward, his palms damp, when she gets into the elevator. The doors begin to close. Just before they do, a hand inserts itself, another employee of the corporation, just in time to catch the elevator down to the lobby. The woman smiles and nods to him. They do not exchange small talk. She does not dance. She never dances when anyone is in the elevator with her. Does she know about the camera and the control panel? She must. Surveillance is everywhere. But every day he sees her, sometimes alone and sometimes amid her fellow office drones, and it is only alone that she suddenly begins pirouetting over and over and over, until the elevator stops and she is not dizzy because she has used the door seam to spot herself. Or swaying in a circle, <clears throat> her hips gyrating in a way that would make the concerned women for America much more concerned. But as the guard watches her, he thinks maybe this is how Salome made John the Baptist lose his head. This is why dancing is illegal. This will send me to hell, he tells himself. Hell in a handbasket in a government detention camp, but he cannot tear his eyes away. Shift change, change shift, day in and day out, and finally he can no longer bear the torment. He looks for her in the lunchroom cafeteria. She is not there. He contrives to take his break standing near her favorite elevator, but she does not come. He skims the employee Facebook, hoping, hoping, but he does not see her. He wonders why they have not yet come for him. But they do not come, maybe they are busy, and as the shifts change and shift, he begins to believe that God has sent her to him. The pastor's words from Wednesday night Bible study and Sunday afternoon service suddenly make sense. If a tree falls in the forest and there's no one around to hear it, it makes a sound if God wills. The elevator woman is that sound. She inspires and exalts the guard. She fills him with a fervor that, is, that he believes is holy. To dance with her is to embody prayer. He weeps as he tries to find her and fails. Finally, he loses control. He is overwhelmed by the fundamental emptiness of his, of his life. He needs. On the little monitor screen, she dances, this time something <coughs> most definitely prescribed because it is foreign and heathen. He thinks maybe it is Thai. She weaves her head from side to side like a snake, and maybe she means to evoke Eve or even Lilith most evil. Either way, he is bewitched. He leaps up from his chair and tears through the hallways and does not care that he is frightening everyone that the cameras will catch his strange behavior and some more diligent guard will report him. He tears through the halls, <coughs> fluorescent change, corridor shift, and suddenly he is at the elevator. He has beaten the elevator there. He will meet her, meet her at last. The doors open, she is not there.
He has helped. He has been a good American all his life, obedient and steadfast, and this is a minor setback. In the camp, he learns that it was all, all an hallucination, <clears throat> caused not by lack of faith, but misplaced faith. The elevator woman may well have been there, but if so, she was sent to tempt him. How foolish was he to fall prey. Now he sits up again in the dark little room with the monitors and <clears throat> let's try that again. Now he sits again in the dark little room with the monitors and resolutely tells himself that he does not see the woman dancing. <coughs> she is not there. If a tree falls in the forest and there's no one around to hear it, it makes a sound of God wills. But that is a tree, not a woman, and God does not will a woman to dance. It is shameful and sinful to question the will of God. Still, the guard cannot help wondering. He does not want to think this thought, but sly, like temptation, it comes anyhow. If, if a tree falls, if a tree falls and there's no one around to hear it but God, would it really bother with anything so mundane as making a sound, or would it dance? <laughs> story. I, I do write short stories which are uh, science fiction, fantasy, some horror, some mainstream, a little bit of everything. Um, but my forthcoming novel um, is actually fantasy and I see there's a horrible editor in the, office, in the audience so I have to say something about the book. Um, the book is coming out in February. It's called The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms. Uh, it is the first of a fantasy trilogy um, set in a secondary world about um, basically a world in which human beings have enslaved their own gods and are using them as sort of living weapons of mass destruction. Um, and the story focuses on a young woman who is a member of the family that controls these gods and uh, is all about political intrigue as she gets sucked into family drama and has to figure out how to deal with <coughs> politics um, when you're dealing with gods. And it will be out in February. <laughs> So uh, actually, that's a fantastic idea, I have to say. <laughs> um, just out of curiosity, have you ever written a short story from that universe? Um, I am working on several. I have yeah. not finished any of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have a deadline, so book three has got to be done <laughs> first. <laughs> yeah, book three first. Is that your first entree into science fiction, and where did you get the inspiration? The short story? Uh, no, the, the, oh, uh, the novel. Oh, coming out February. Yeah, um, I, I've been writing novels for, for several, well, probably since I was 10, actually. Uh, my, my first novel was uh, horrible, because um, I was 10. Um, but, uh, you know, I only recently started writing novels good enough to publish. Um, and uh, I've written short stories all along. I've uh, been getting short stories published uh, professionally since uh, 2002 or so. Um, so this will be my first novel, yes. Uh, the first one getting published. Um, I have others. Um, I read the book already, and I have to say, it really is fantastic. So yeah, everyone, you certainly should pick it up outside mm -hmm. of February. Um, and uh, so I thought maybe we'd move along with the readings, and then after that, we'll have a little discussion. Oh, that's okay. Okay. There's a uh, uh, this is a short story by a poet uh, writer. His name is Koa Jachak, and it's a, of a group of about five or six that I uh, thought were interesting. Uh, fantasy stories that were somehow unlike what is published in the United States or England because they're Polish in different ways. And this story is Polish, not so much in terms of the tropes that he uses or the ideas, but the fact that the background is Poland and its Polish history. And his, his use of what, what kind of traditional fantasy uh, devices is in the service of something that is that is very um, different because it's 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 politically involved and kind of morally involved and, and, and nationally involved in something 
that the Poland story is a, is a rather dark one in that, as you know, Poland was partitioned. They, it was divided up without, without any fighting. Uh, it, other countries ruled Poland. Other armies were in Poland. And the experience that's behind this story is, has to do with the, the German army, the Russian army, and what was going on. And, and Poland was sort of kind of caught in the middle and often um, felt betrayed. Um, they were side and, and, um, and they were, things didn't work out. So there's a kind of a tragic uh, uh, aspect uh, to this, to this author's writing. So I just thought, uh, this is very brief, much briefer than, than what you read, I just thought I'd give you a taste of the author having fun with what I think of as kind of uh, maybe American fantasy writing. And he's, he's enjoying himself. He likes, he likes science fiction, he likes to write it, he likes to read it. And so this is, this is probably into a showdown, there's a lot of fighting because he likes fighting too. Um, so <clears throat> I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna explain anymore. This is, by the way, the, what follows is not Polish. It's Mane Karata Mane Teboi Kadam Kadam. The elf's eyes glittered. A stream of light, like a white worm, burrowed through the darkness. It curled, looped, gathered, and swelled, etching structures of white across the void. It drove all darkness from the world, making room for day. The elf stretched out his hands, and from them too light flowed every color, furling at his fingertips, spilling and sparkling like water from a fountain. The circle of heat increased. The forest had disappeared somewhere, Robert realized. They were in the non-world, on a vast plain. To the horizon was yellow earth and strips of sky blue grass undulating in a warm yet acrid breeze. In the distance, Robert saw the tangles of strange trees. Behind them were towers, slender, high, rising directly from the ground, not surrounded at the bottom by walls or lesser buildings. These towers commanded the plain. Red, curved, twisted, they leaned on one another, then separated, leaving wells of space among them. They bulged and thinned. They sent arms to one another, creating bridges. Their windows were empty holes. Despite the distance, Robert could see the rust of entropy on the towers. The stairways were broken. Jagged openings gaped in the turret roofs. Bridges, bridge arches, fragmented, led nowhere. Behold the rooms of the city Oma, of the kingdom of passes. This is the verge of the world, said Hardadian, and his shadow fell on Robert. Robert looked up and shivered. His guide, who had been dressed in the army fatigues of the elves, was gone. In his place stood a powerfully built warrior in splendid armor. On the breastplate gleamed the colors of Hardadian's house. A red cape fluttered from his shoulders to his knees. The elf's bow was twice as thick as before, and the sword he unsheathed pulsed like a ruby. The sky above them was pitch black. Thank you.